Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Charles Dickens writes, heaven knows we need never be ashamed of our tears. For they are like rain upon the blinding dust of earth. church had a reputation and what I started discovering over here is people coming to my waiting room and they had uh, come let's say let's use a specific example from Zimbabwe uh, had left because they felt endangered uh, felt that because they were in the opposition their lives weren't safe and this was the best place to come. Would arrive at Park Station, 
and found themselves being dispossessed of everything they had. Certificates, clothes, money, anything. Um, and would eventually end up here. And I would have grown adults coming into my office and just dissolving, desperate. As safe a haven as it was, it also incurred the anger of the authorities because it began to be seen as a center of resistance to the way the government was handling the whole issue of migrants and particularly refugees. Let me speak very personally and say what motivates me is that my engagement with people, in, in a sense, in a sense, leads me to what the truth is. You know, and that's, that's the search, to, to hear the, the stories and to be able to understand from both sides the, the nuances of what it means to be a human being. This place is not good and clean and fresh. It really isn't. I mean, it takes you right to the underbelly of the most profoundly vulnerable parts of our humanity. I could see that my life is actually in danger. And I couldn't continue forcing myself to live in Zimbabwe. One way or another, I had to call it a day. I had to leave everything I had. Um, for the, it's, it's of no help to say, I'll help my kids when I'm in a grave. How are you able to help your kids when you're in a grave? So I would rather run away to another foreign country and start a new life. But if I be humble, I can be honest with you right now. Uh, I would rather be in prison while well I'm in Zimbabwe than the whole life of South Africa. Um, Opportunities in Zimbabwe at that moment were only given to uh, people who were in ZANPF. Myself, as I was growing, I started to be a member of MDC. So everyone in my village knew that, oh, Raymond is supporting an opposition party. So privileges were given to people who were collaborating with Zanpia. When I was in my house, my wife was sharing food. And you know, I was looking at her like, who is gonna get a better share because of the starvation which was within my family. We could struggle to have a meal of the day, you know. Sometimes we have to sleep without having a meal. So it kept stressing me up to, ne to an extent of deciding to go out of the house looking for green pastures. And I decided to cross the border illegally. I crossed illegally to South Africa. You know, the levels of injustice are so profound that they demand of those who are not going to be involved in something, in the struggle for something better. They demand a complete annihilation of conscience. 
And when I went to home office, the reception I got to home office is simple. I'm here to apply for Islam. I do not want to live in a country illegal. I do not want to waste taxpayer, taxpayers money in South Africa to have some people donating money for me to eat. I went to school, I'm proud of that. My parents tried their level best. I can work and I can be successful once I get the correct papers. But the, the reception you get also at your home affairs, you find at the end of the day there's only one answer you're left with. Find the money, support corruption for you to make a living in South Africa. If you find the money, you pay the home affairs personal, you get all the paperwork you want with no hassles. If you feel that you want to do the right thing with all the paperwork, the correct way, forget it, smile in South Africa. There is nothing like... We, I always laugh when people talk of democracy. Democracy in South Africa. It's all paperwork. On paper, there is democracy. There is freedom of expression. There is what? But in real life, in this country, there is no freedom. This country, frankly, despite the fact that I'm in their country, but I'm denouncing their country, the whole system of their country. It's a ridiculous. You go to home affairs at five o'clock in the morning and they wait and they wait and they're harassed and they're abused and they're corrupted and they are bribed. And when they get to the counter, it's not a, a mellifluous welcome. It's a kind of feeling, you know, you're invading our space. You don't belong here, you know. Where do they belong? You know, in a coffin, I suppose. Actually, to come to South Africa because of uh, political reasons. Like, I had to join the, the opposition party in Zimbabwe, which is MDC, the time when I was still at school. Then, actually, we wanted to try and change the situation which was in Zimbabwe at that time. So then, it turned difficult for us, the school kids by that time. So we tried to run to South Africa for, for our own safety. Since when I came here, actually, things never got well for me and me thinking that I'm hiding from the ruling party. These guys had to follow me one night when I was sleeping at my place where I was renting. Then they had to come over the night, they had to knock on my door. After when I refused to open the door, they had to forcefully they open the door, coming inside. They started by hitting me, fighting with me. Then they finally dragged me out of the house and they tied my hands and legs with wire and they put some dirty rags at my bag, inside my clothes. They had to pour some diesel. After pouring diesel, then they light it on, burning the whole of my bag. Actually, the way they tied my, 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 my legs with wire and hands and burned with diesel, actually it is not a thing that they wanted me to, to survive. Actually, they wanted to kill me, it's quite obvious. Now I'm in Johannesburg, not knowing where to go, who can I talk to. I was just wandering around Park Station, the bridge. I don't know the place. In my country, we don't have these very tall buildings. I was from work and at my flat in Ubro, where I was staying. Uh, it was boring me because of corruption that was happening there. The security which was there wanted 10 rand from me every day when I enter into the flat. And I couldn't pay it every day because I was paying rent as well. Luckily, I saw a policeman. By the time I was speaking to him, he just came to me and he clapped me, you know, and I started bleeding. And I asked you, why are you beating me? I'm coming to you as a policeman to help me, you see. He said, well, you are from Zimbabwe? 
What are you doing here in South Africa? Go back to Zimbabwe. Where's your passport? You know? And I showed you my passport. I gave you my passport. From that day up to now, I never received it. I don't know what she did with my passport. Now I'm struggling. I cannot go out of South Africa. I'm like, I'm in prison in South Africa, you know? What happens if the future leader of this country happens to be in this building right at this moment as a child? And I must tell you that there are some of the children in this building who are as sharp as you can imagine. We hold sway on their futures. Their brilliance is not going to end up in a rubbish bin, that's for sure. How is it going to be capitalized? Wait, wait. Scary I, I don't drop well. you. I don't drop you. I don't do What's up is scary move? I can tell you lies. The scary move. I can tell you lies. And say that, oh, my friend, I'm going my friend, and I'm selling a car. Give me 4,000, you're going to take the car. And then he gives the latches of two feet. It doesn't work by power. And then at 28, the 28 is the person who does crime. When I was released from hospital, uh, uh, my, my fellow members, the MDC members, they told me that I have to go and stay at the, at the church. They met at this church with the bishop, with the bishop Paul Veren. When I went there, Bishop Paul Veren actually, he gave me uh, the place to, to sleep, a nice place to sleep. Actually, I was sleeping with school kids in a, whereby I was facing difficulties. I couldn't bend by that time, I could not run, I could not even do anything. Because of my, my back, it was very painful. So I was always staying inside the church, indoors, being kept indoors. He's the one who actually, actually uh, getting me some soap to bath, food, everything. is the one who was doing it for me. Uh, it's my own, it's my own country. Like everybody will always say that home is best. Actually, Zimbabwe, even if it could be turned the way it is right now, I'm always thinking about home. I like in my own place. Like here, I'm living in fear. Even if I would just think I could 
run to South Africa to places and place by place to place to place, but still, I don't feel like, what can I say? <laughs> Sorry. Can hold. Isn't it true that some of the most profound intellects have their offices on these streets? You know, the scientists, the dreamers, the poets, and some of the most depraved criminals walk on the same stones day in and day out. Actually, well, what I was thinking about my life, actually it changed uh, the moment, uh, the day, the time I was banned. Uh, right now, I cannot even know what am I going to do tomorrow, boss. I cannot even work for myself. I could even try to do a lot of things on my own, but I could find it's very difficult for me to do it. I have to rely on somebody now to do it for me. And actually, the person to check on me, it's very impossible, boss. You'll be also looking for his own life. So right now I'm just running away from something that I don't really know exactly what it is. Because actually I'm running away for somebody whom I don't see, whom I don't know. So I went to the police station. I opened the case about that policeman. Because I, I wanted my passport. You know, I was worried about my passport because I knew that they were going to arrest me, you know. So I opened the docket, nothing happened. They did nothing, you know. It's useless to follow up a case against these government officials. And you can't see if the case is going or not. By the time I was going back to the police station doing a follow up, they even told me, if you keep on doing this coming here, trying to arrest a policeman, you are going to die before you go back home. Down the line, I spent about a very few weeks, less than a month, I met with this, that crew from Ubro police station. They arrest me now. Why? Illegal immigrant. 
But I had a proof that I opened the case. The policeman took my passport. I had an affidavit, case number, everything I'm showing them. They say, oh, you want to arrest a policeman? Oh, they beat me, they kicked me off. You see, they arrested me for about four months. They take, took me to Sun City. It is a big jail, which is uh, that side of Soweto. And I didn't feel well comfortable inside there because of unhealthy living conditions, you know. I think we live in a context that nurtures violence. That, whether we like it or not, sanctifies violence. You know, we, we have an ethos of guns and weapons and defenses and electricity to keep out humanity. I think that projects into a place of viciousness being normalized. We think that refinement is marble and ermine, but in actual fact, true refinement is to be found in the dignity of a person who lives on a step, but has an expansive humanity that imagines something different. Um. I've always been the type to kind of go straight into something and really want to experience it firsthand. So experiencing the inner city became kind of my primary priority almost as, as soon as I, I moved here. Then comes the beginning of this year and I said, why not um, look at staying in another building that I wanted to research, which is the one in Dornfontein. And that's a, it's an about, well, it was an, a warehouse where the same sort of thing happened 
it's a, a company went bankrupt and then people started moving in and nobody stopped them and it's impossible to evict them now without a court order because it's over six months etc um, so now I mean it's what's it, they some people call it a shack farm um, some people simply call it you know I mean you divide up the spaces and it's literally shacks built without roofs um, within the building so it's a uh, Family is staying in one small unit. Electricity is free because it's still an illegal connection, but uh, and they don't have any running water. But to cover the cleaning and security, it's only a month. So I stayed there for, um, for I, I was aiming to stay there for a month. Um, I didn't make it past a week. It, it was really hectic. And basically, I mean, I, and I, it's not like I don't, I have a, quite a high threshold in what I can handle. Um, but that, that was a hectic building. I could handle everything. The, the worst thing was the bed bugs. Um, I just, I simply, I, I, I erupted in like, you know, they were, they were all over and people were asking me what's going on, you know, because I was still working at the same time and studying. So <laughs> at like, you know, I'm operating in this very different life <laughs> um, and people were still, still, you know, I mean, people were just very concerned. And I, in the morning, I'd actually wake up and struggle to breathe because my body reacted very badly to, um, I got very bad allergies from the, from the bed bug bites. When I moved my, my, my microbes there, it actually had an infestation of cockroaches and like a whole nest. Um, and we didn't notice at first, but every time you could use the microwave, it would, you would get that stench of cockroach. But I mean, the problem is that people bring their children with them. And so then, and the children do not have a choice um, of whether to stay there or not. And the health conditions that some of these kids are subject to it's it's so bad and that that's what made me realize that actually you do have to have some sort of government regulation there needs to be some sort of intervention and it's not necessarily to say that government that you are not allowed having communal spaces to rent you're not allowed having these rooms or spaces to rent you're not allowed having some kind of informal rental market but there needs to be some sort of intervention there needs to be some sort of normative value placed to say this is the bottom line which things cannot go beyond. I was released in court number four at Ubro uh, court. It was a difficult moment for me because I had to go back into the shadows of Johannesburg. I, I had only a small bag that one of my friends gave me in the cell because I had nothing just to walk around again under these very long buildings trying to connect again with new people. We're living like moors. You know what moors do when the soil is moisture after rains. That's when you see moors playing on top of the ground. But when the sun comes, you see moors hiding because of the police. They are looking for money from us. It's not easy. I have so many challenges of, I can't, find a better job here in South Africa because of xenophobia. I don't have money. Just imagine an extent of struggling to find a meal of the day. 
I cannot communicate with my son. I spend a very long time without talking to him. I don't even know what size of a shoe does he wear. Where is he going to sleep? What is he going to eat? You know, I don't know. I can just say I'm a father, but who is taking care of you? Women are vulnerable. The gentle are vulnerable. The dispossessed are vulnerable. The weak are vulnerable. And we've got to be very careful of all those categories because in actual fact that may be where our strength is. It's incomprehensible that you can be so immersed in the profundity of what is happening to human beings in this inner city. And the rest of the country is completely oblivious. I'm very concerned you talk about alternative accommodation. I'll be happy if in this building one can say he has been given an alternative accommodation. You know, I'm from magistrate court now uh, as a human rights activist uh, in Roddy Port because our program is that good. We need to, inv we need to in intervene with courts because last week Friday I have a meeting with seven magistrates uh, talking about this eviction. The question is, Section 20, Section 26.1 and Section 26.3, that says good, no people must be evicted without alternative accommodation. But people have been evicted without alternative accommodation. You see here in town, people, their goods, the, the fridge will fly from ninth floor to ground floor. TV will fly from 11th floor to ground floor. The question is, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in township, people have been given RTPs. But in the inner city, people who went last time they've been given building, to own building. These people are renting for more than 30 years. How long are they going to rent? If these people died, their children are going to swear them at the graveyard. Would my father and my mother are useless. You never give me a shelter. I think this is very important, Peter. We are talking about the life of the people. We must talk seriously here. <laughs> You know, I'm always in court every day. I'm seeing what is happening in court, Bishop. It's a shame and disgrace. This is what not we are fighting for. On a serious note, Bishop. Thank you so much. So we're sitting in a city where we have large numbers of people below the level that we can service that are living in, uh, in places that are not fit for human habitation. They are destitute and they are living in, uh, in areas where I'm surprised we haven't had major outbreaks of disease. Um, people, there are no toilet facilities, there's no running water, um, there are rats running around, garbage, sewage all over the place. I mean, little kids in their nappies running around in this environment. And the sad part about it is that, you know, people have this perception in their head maybe that these people are, are they're bad people, and it's, in fact, it's not, in the, it's not, the, not the case at all. Uh, the bad people are probably the, the hijackers or the slumlords are controlling the buildings, but the people inside, uh, I mean, all they, they're all always poor. And the problem is that that onus has really fallen on council and government to service that sector of the market because the private sector can't get in there because the model doesn't work. Um, the, the problem as well is that uh, these people living in these conditions are not paying nothing for living there. The, whichever gang is sitting downstairs with their guns and whatever else, and we've certainly experienced that a few times, um, they're quite violent, they're aggressive, and they're there running, them as, they're running these buildings as, as businesses. And, um, you know, these people are paying anything from 600 to 1,000 rand a month to live in this absolute squatter. Uh, there are no services, there's no cleaning that takes place, um, and if they don't pay, typically they'll probably be beaten up and thrown out. 
So you know we need to we need to be able to address this this sector of the market. Uh, look, the, you know at the same time I guess you've got to understand that the council and government are faced with huge problems. Um, and I think as Joburg rate pays, we face big problems because there's this massive influx into Johannesburg, not only from the rural areas of South Africa, but all the way from all over Africa. You know, the, the problem is that um, we're dealing in a situation where if council and government are not addressing the issues and the burden is falling on the, on the property owner. Now, you have a mix of rights. You obviously, there's a, there's a right to housing, but there's also a right to property ownership and that if you own the property, you're entitled to have your property. So you're kind of mixed up in this, 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 social, in this social fight that's taking place and it's really, I think, coming out of uh, lack of delivery from government and council. I mean, that's really where the problem starts. The, uh, you can't blame the property owners for emptying their buildings out so they can develop them uh, and to, to minimise their losses on these properties. And at the same time, you've got to wonder where are these people going to go next when they do get evicted. The last factor I believe very firmly in is that government and council need to make it attractive for the private sector to step into this market because on their own they're never going to fix the problem. But in inner city it doesn't happen that way. You call police, they'll come with 21 cars from different police stations and say everybody out. When you say everybody out and then obvious the tenants, all of them, they're going out. Then the police go inside. They take TVs, they take money. Some of them they find them in a bathroom they, they assault people nakedly, Bishop. <coughs> you know, even rape them. You know, I mean, what kind of society that are we living in? So again, now these police, end of the day, what are they going to do? They are going to say, uh, we are here to make a handover. You know, that handover, leaders, if they are leaders of within the building, those buildings, all of them, those leaders have been arrested for no apparent reason. Now, what is happening? The police now, I can call the range of police here. They are, what do you call it, fabrication cases. Now, they don't want to go to court anymore. They'll say somebody's hijacking the building and collecting the building. People have been charged with serious allegations. You know, there's been strict, stringent controls in the last year or so, you know, to try and, and control it. Because municipalities, not only the city of Johannesburg, have been complaining a lot. You know, because you know, once the people are led through the borders, you know, nobody, you know, cares much as to where they will end up. So they end up becoming your problem. And, and, and I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we cannot, uh, uh, as government employees, as also as responsible Africans as well, you know, say if you're not South African, it's fine, you can stay under the bridge, you can stay in a slum building, you cannot, you know, provide water for you. As long as you are here, you are, you are entitled to basic health care, basic services, and I think, that on its own put serious strain on government. What the city have, have come up with, you know, the city, I think they've come to realize that uh, alone they cannot um, be able to address issues of slum loading unless they involve the private sector. So that's why you get a lot of uh, 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 private sectors like AFCO and uh, um, you know, various other uh, uh, property owners coming in and purchasing uh, bed buildings to turn them around and create a, alternative accommodation and affordable accommodation for most of the residents in the inner city. And I don't think it has ever been the city's intention of throwing people out on the streets, you know, because we are uh, partly responsible to ensure that, you know, the, the there isn't anybody who's, you know, sleeping, you know, out in the cold that people are supposed to be housed. And that's what the, our constitution say. So again, okay, I don't want to say there's a best lawyer here, but what I'm saying is that, Guti, if we can get that best lawyer, I'll clap my hand, and then I'll buy on my knees to that lawyer mm -hmm. to say we'll be helping our people. And it's that smudging of the people, the humanity into nothingness that enables the violence. I can be violent with you, but not touch you. I can in actual fact kill you completely and then force you to carry on living your life. I can desecrate you so comprehensively that in the end there's nothing left.
if South Africans, they would realize that foreigners, they're also people. They also belong from somewhere. Okay, they come to South Africa only because of difficulties in their country. So the thing is they should understand about a foreigner actually taking that person as a human, somebody who lives, somebody who also talks like them, somebody who also wants a rest like them as well. Because I just come here next door, I'm the worst enemy, I'm the foreigner in South Africa, and I don't know how do they see me as up to an extent of killing me, you know. So, I, I just, I pray for them as well, so that they can proceed. God can provide them what they want, you know, so that they will not beat me as a foreigner in their country. Ultimately, the question of migrancy is an international question. You know, we think that our identity is to be formulated in our place of birth, in our family name, in our identity number, and in our little green book. It's got nothing to do with our identity at all. Absolutely nothing. It might give you validity in this country. But in actual fact, it's got nothing to do with who you really are. And that's the stuff we've got to begin to start liberating in the understanding of people. You know, people need to understand that people from other countries don't pop into South Africa because it happens to be this wide, open, armed, welcoming host. It's in actual fact got a stinking reputation in terms of its aggression and violence against people. So for people to still be making decisions to come here, you must, you must really understand, <laughs> they are desperate. Then that means we, the majority of Zimbabwe, we are suffering because of the bigger chefs of Zimbabwe. If you are now forced to come here in South Africa, hoping to stay, we can start a life, then what do you get? Worse than your own country. The corruption in South Africa is worse. Crime rate in South Africa is worse. You can die because of a one rand in South Africa. To South Africans, I'm encouraging them to understand the sense of humanity. No matter where this person is coming from, there are push factors. A man cannot just be crazy to go out of his mother's house, going to another place. Home is best. We are all human beings. There's no need for them to discriminate me. I become worried when they say, you foreigners, go back home. What do you want in our country? They beat us, they kill us. Right now my mother, she's alone with my own son and that She's facing actually difficulties because I don't have time to go and see my own son and see her as well. I, for that boy, actually, I got lots and a lot of dreams, but actually I cannot make them come true. The millions mean nothing. Millions mean nothing. And it would, be, it would be a wonderful thing to see our politicians beginning to take an example of living a simple lifestyle. 
I think it was Gandhi who said, you know, live simply so that others may simply live. If we could have a school of politicians for whom it became obscene to have as much as they've got at the moment, perhaps we could begin to start changing something for this continent. And not just for this continent. This continent has been ravaged by greedy and selfish and corrupt people. And we are perpetuating that stuff on and on and on. And we must clearly understand that the violation of other human beings comes from exactly that place. Greed and corruption. As we walk down the streets of Johannesburg, if we do not have to be afraid of the fact that there are hungry, desperate, broken people on the streets because we've taken proper care of their fundamental needs, then maybe we would have become true politicians.